the, the Texas A&M Institute for Data Science seminar, and we are excited today to have Paul D. Miller, otherwise known as DJ Spooky. He's a composer, a multimedia artist, and a writer whose work immerses audience in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. He's traveled the world, and we are thrilled to have him here today to talk about his creative process and how he makes his work. Um, Vivid Lab um, is, we, we've kind of uh, wrangled Paul in, he may not, he may know this, may not, but to kind of, we, we originally proposed Vivid Lab and had sound as part of our intersensory component for visualization, our intersensory uh, experience for um, experiencing data, I guess. And so we didn't have a sound artist on our team. And so we're kind of, uh, we brought Paul here to pick his brain. Um, he was, we have to thank the Academy of Visual and Performing Arts who brought him in the fall to do a living room session with the string quartet that was um, really, really inspiring. And so after that, I went up and talked him and we've been talking ever since and so he's back to tell us more about his work so please i'll leave it to you first of all courtney courtney you guys have a, a treasure in courtney so um it's it's an absolute pleasure to uh, get to know her and uh uh tamu uh, better all right so just by way of a little bit of background background uh, my name is Paul Miller, uh, and I'm a musician, an artist, and a writer. Um, I'm currently an artist in residence at Yale University's uh, Center for Collaborative Arts and Media. It's a new department that Yale is setting up for interdisciplinary collaboration. And one thing that many people who are friends of mine in the academic scene well, generally tended to tell me is that the, the silo effect of one department uh, or one particular medium just gets into a kind of a, you know, Foxhole, so to speak, and that never ends up talking to other participants. So what I'm going to do today um, is kind of walk you guys through a little bit of my process. Um, it's a slightly different format because I was not expecting to be doing this live as a Zoom, so I'm switching my slides around and stuff. So forgive me if it's not as uh, polished as I would normally do. So okay, so what we're going to do is begin the day with getting you guys to think about graphic design. And the idea of speculative, like how narrative and algorithms intersect. So, here we go. Um, basically, I majored in uh, macroeconomics and um, kind of I went to Bowdoin College in Maine. And Bowdoin is the little I was in Bowdoin, Bates, Wesley, and Oberlin. But one of my degrees was in philosophy, and I was really fascinated. With the when you think about dimensionalization of uh, data, one of the things you have to re realize is that obviously math and music have an intense overlap. So Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz, um, is generally considered to be one of the most important figures in uh, mathematics, but he was also a philosopher. And so with the invention of calculus, him and Newton, uh, it, they invented it at uh, the same time. But one could argue that the the invention of calculus really helped shift the narrative to more and more complex issues. And, but he was also very interested in music. So this infamous phrase from him as a mathematician, a philosopher, and a conceptualist, he says, music is the pleasure of the human mind that experiences uh, counting you know, without being aware that it's counting. So let's say that what I'm going to be talking about today is this idea of, of pattern recognition, how we think about uh, many of the issues facing us now in the era of chat, GPT, uh, machine learning, and neural networks is that the data set that the algorithms have to engage uh, with ChatGPT, for example, is based on hundreds of terabytes of data and trawling the web for every possible artistic image or phraseology. So that data set, for me at least as an artist, I like to think of that as a record collection. Literally, it's all on the tent, it's a record. So when you think about what we're facing now, we're in an era where these kind of ideas of speculative fictions, speculative narratives have come home to roost. What you're seeing here is uh, what I, I kind of thought I'd begin the discussion with is this idea of how speculative narrative really transforms how we think about what possible possibilities face. So, for example, this is an image that highlights what you call the Dutch tulip mania. And several centuries ago, at the height of the beginning of colonialism, uh, the Dutch invented what you call the joint stock market. 
And at that time, that idea of narrative and perception of market forces. Uh, so, for example, if you would perceive a market going up, everyone would start rushing to buy, and that drives the market up. Same thing happened with this. We call it tulip mania. And they would actually go into a speculative frenzy on this. And so this is generally considered to be the first crypto market. Um, now, what's so fun about the tulip mania is that it was flowers. And people would literally, at one point, if you had a rare color, you'd be able to actually sell it. And that would be the equivalent of someone's year salary. You know, So you had people going into this frenzy of market speculation. But if you think about cryptocurrency and most of the issues that face us today in a, in a sort of a data-driven narrative society that we live in right now, we're back in this era of speculative bubbles. So instead of people saying, all right, I'm going to get how many flowers or whatever, you build your cultural capital based on how many clicks and likes you get. We're, we're in the attention economy. Now, what does that have to do with music? Well, this is a great phrase that I love to try out when people talk about science versus music. Uh, this is Richard Dawkins. He says, science is the poetry of reality. Now, what I want to do today is unpack some of the issues facing me as a composer in the 21st century, but also the way the arts is radically transforming out of um, centuries and centuries, or if not millennia, of thinking about images as our main sort of vocabulary, our visual vocabulary. So if we think of science, um, say, for example, the last three centuries, obviously, more scientific progress has happened in the last three centuries than probably thousands of years before. Now, some people say, why is that? Um, from the viewpoint of the arts, that's because I think more people have access to data, and then that data allows to create an intense feedback mechanism so that people can exchange and have more robust ideas. So that conversation, uh, there's people like, for example, uh, Jared Diamond wrote this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. If you haven't read it, it's, a, it's an all-time classic. Um, but basically, there's all these civilizations in touch with one another and exchanging the best ideas. The internet has just put that on steroids and made it go into warp speed. So one could argue um, a composer facing that, if you were Bach or Beethoven, you'd be playing you know, the tuning systems of the ancient Greeks. Uh, the math that the ancient Greeks had, for example, was based on certain kind of ideas that the Indians, for example, had a different trajectory because they, of the invention of zero, for example. So I'm going to circle back to that in a second, but this is my family in 1972. Uh, both my parents were professors. My dad uh, was dean of Howard University's law school, and my mom was a historian of design. So I kind of grew up in a household where design and the idea that human rights and the idea of social good overlapped. And so that was DC, Washington, D.C. in 1972. Now, to go back to zero, um, this is a, one of my favorite kind of ways to highlight when scientists and artists do collaborations. Um, Einstein, obviously, is probably familiar to you all, but the gentleman next to him is Rabindranath Tagore, who is a, the first uh, Asian to win the Nobel Prize. Now, amusingly enough, uh, he is Bengali and so Indian. Um, and what's fascinating with this is that he's also re really interested in mathematics as well. So Einstein and him won the Nobel Prize the same year. They were backstage. Einstein was pacing as one does before you get the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, and so he was very nervous. And Einstein, when he would get nervous, he would he would also play violin. And it said that the playing of the music allowed his mind to really finish the equations that he had been thinking about. So amusing enough, music for him was a part of his math. And the process of that, in the process of that, playing violin, pacing, uh, he would play stuff like box Goldberg variations or other kinds of more mathematical, classical. And so he <laughs> and grabbing the door seat and he says, hey man. The music you're playing, you got to come to India. We have much more complex music because we invented zero before you guys. Mm -hmm. And he's so Einstein pauses for a second. It's like, you know, yeah, the Greeks and Romans didn't have zero. Their tuning systems were kind of, that's why you have whole tone, half tone. If anyone plays a music instrument, most of our tuning systems come out of the ancient Greeks. But the Indians had invented the concept of zero or infinity or nothingness as part of their culture several thousand years before the West. And their math uh, influenced, uh, you know, the invention of our numeric system, for example. And I'm going to just show you this. Yeah, there we go. So when you see our numbers, they're actually Arabic, and that's what we call them Arabic numerals. But amusing enough, the Arabs borrowed it from the Indians. Um, so if you were in South Asia, um, the concept of zero here um, was a fascinating kind of representation of of both the spiritual reflection of infinity, but also how math and nothingness and the infinite possibilities of a kind of a world of multiverse coming to be. 
So amusing enough, when I say multiverse, many of us knew that, know that now from Marvel comics and stuff like that. Everyone, you know, every major movie right now has a multiverse. But um, for Indian culture, literally, it, it was kind of this idea of infinity as part of nature itself, uh, computing this idea of fulfillment of infinity. Um, long story, but zero in their culture. There's temples to zero if you go to India. Some of the oldest temples are math that is carved on a wall. But you know, this gentleman here uh, leads us to another dimension here. Uh, this is Al Kurazami. Um, in fact, when I, if you actually say the name algorithm, that's him. Um, now, he was a mathematician in ninth century uh, Baghdad. And again, the Muslim uh, culture at that time had a very advanced uh, mathematics. He's also the inventor of algebra. Uh, so algorithms and algebra have the same root term, and they both go back to his name, amusing enough, because the Europeans didn't know how to pronounce his name. So eventually you have algebra, which is in Arabic, and al Kurizami becomes algorithm. So amusing enough, we're in an era of algorithms, zeros and ones are what makes our entire digital media work. Um, and so when, whenever you think about using a computer, um, you're basically um, using his um, ideas of num num numbers and the way that those numbers um, been migrated to the West. If you guys know, there's a gentleman by the name of Fibonacci, and Fibonacci invented and took a lot of the Arabic numerals to the Renaissance in Italy. Now, at the Renaissance, at the same time that's going on, you have other artists like da Vinci, for example, you have the Medici, uh, you have all sorts of people doing this interdisciplinary approach to the arts. Um, so, at the epicenter of that, one could argue, skip ahead a couple centuries here. And the West has adopted these numbers, but I'm using the Pope, um, using a band the number zero for several for a while. Um, in fact, uh, there was a controversy when Fibonacci released his book. Uh, it's called Liber Abaci, where he had copied Al Qurizami's number systems and then made it popular for European bankers. And um, uh, in Italy at the time, the bankers, even the term bank, B A N K, uh, you know, is an Italian name for just a table where people would play with numbers. So I love to chuckle about how um, here we are several centuries later, and everything we're doing is basically a conversation between this gentleman, uh, Fibonacci, and then a pope that was crazy and hated the number zero. Um, so our math and our computer systems and everything we use comes from this kind of tension and you know, the social implications of music and math. So amusing enough, when Einstein had heard from uh, Reverend Jack Tagore backstage, one of the fun parts of that was that it, it sparked a conversation and they ended up writing a book together called on the nature of reality um it's the idea of one of the world's leading experimental physicists talking to one of the world's leading poets so you have the poets poetics of physics uh it's a good book interesting book and uh, if you ever have a long flight you know can have at it but the idea that i want to start with today because you guys are dealing with data visualization is that there's a lot more of a historical co continuity uh, with the arts and math than one would suspect. Um, and as a composer, I'd like to explore that sort of subtle interplay. Um, okay, so this is broccoli. Now, why am I showing you mathematical broccoli? Well, some of you might know this also as a uh, Fourier uh, kind of system here. And amusing enough, um, this notion of the fractals, you're seeing more, you know, M-O-I-R-E, more uh, patterns. And nature itself, one could argue, is a mathematical construct. Um, there's a long tension in physics right now about math and representation of nature. But again, here we are in a digital era where many of us have access to tools like your cell phone or your laptop that have far more power than anything most of our ancestors would have ever been able to think of. But so too with nature. Um, and nature optimizes resources and is able to kind of overlap with this stunningly beauty with utility. Um, as a composer, these kind of things really inspire me. All right. So um, you, you guys might be wondering, why is he showing us, OK, mathematical broccoli, a poet talking to a physicist, um, speculative you know, tulips from the beginning of the Dutch tulip mania, or the invention of the concept of zero? Well, here's why. Uh, this is a very famous island called Yap, Y-A-P where they invented this kind of currency. These are called, uh, basically what it would happen is if you did a trade with someone, 
20 guys would have to carry this stone to your house. And if, say, for example, if, I, if you had 15 coconuts and I had a cow and we took it, did a trade, this would mark the trade. So uh, Milton Friedman did his PhD on this. Milton Friedman's one of the world's leading economists in the 20th century about the idea of symbolic exchange. Now, amusingly enough, one day one of these stones fell in the water near the island, and they didn't. They did, it's, it's a stone age economy here. They didn't really have the tools to be able to get it out. It's just like 20 tons, so everyone would know where that stone was, and they would revert, like refer to it as a virtual transaction. So. Some people would say this is the beginning of cryptocurrency, you know, kind of the social ledger. Now, this is a stone age currency, but at the same time, there's a symbolic exchange happening between people who use it. And that's where Milton Friedman, uh, to me, overlaps with some of the conversation a bit. So the economics of perception, how we perceive market forces, how we think of algorithm shaping, storytelling, that's kind of what comes out of my engagement with composing. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is because there's a famous, there's a very famous phrase saying the stone age didn't end for lack of stone. It ended because people had better ideas. And to me, at least as an artist, we're at this strange transition from a kind of an aesthetic stone age into more of a digital conversation where zeros and ones condition all of our kind of creative uh, process. Now, you guys are a data visualization group, but to me, this is a different kind of data, you know, so. Um, I think it's hilarious that they even would carve the currency into a zero. Um, but at the same time, uh, everyone in the village would know who had done the transactions. And because everyone would know, you'd have a social ledger. Really interesting, um, the idea here of Stone Age currency. Yeah. yeah. So I'm hopefully giving you guys a little bit of context about my work. I haven't even shown you guys my work yet, but I'm just giving you a little bit of uh, the conceptual backdrop here. Um, this is a photograph from 1915, and it's showing the gentleman here on the left. Um, that's Luigi Russolo, and he wrote a book called The Art of Noise, um, Arte du Romore, uh, if anyone speaks Italian. But basically, he wanted to do this idea of an acoustic portrait of, uh, of an accelerated you know, urban landscape. Now, the Italian futurists uh, were highly influential throughout most of the 20th century. And their ideas were to break everything down into component elements of sound and image. So um, I'll show you some of the paintings that he did that influenced people like Marcel Duchamp, but also then later on influenced other digi early digital media artists like Nam June Pike um, and other people who were dealing with kind of more digital art from the edge of physical production. So amusing enough, in 1915, when he did this kind of concert, you go to a room, and all the music would be coming out of these, uh, they're called intonal rumore, or noise generators. And the audiences would riot. People say, you know, where's the band? You know, people started throwing like, soda bottles at them, you know, sort of the original punk rock. <laughs> but what's wild about this is that you can easily see who won. I mean, this became basically loudspeakers, which we have pretty much every, most rooms have. Them. And you can see that these kind of ideas here at the beginning of the acoustic revolution of the 20th century, now your cell phone has a speaker, you have headphones, you know, you can only imagine. But at that time, the invention that the artist had was controversial and shocking. So I like to play with that a little bit. And what I'm going to do is show you guys a couple more slides that I think will be helpful for context. Um, uh, I know we're on a time frame here. It is 2.20, so I just want to make sure to respect everybody's time. So. When you kind of think about sort of art and science, amusingly enough, to me at least graphic design is a really good moment for this. So let's show you this. You know, I don't use Zoom for presentations that much, but a second. Yeah, for some reason, when I hit done, it doesn't do anything. So, for example, I just feel like this one image. It's a show selected room. It should be able to get it on the page. Here we go. All right, so this is a photograph um, 
basically at the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was a group of photographers that tried to figure out how do we capture an image and then make that image become uh, kind of a motion capture. And even last night, did anybody watch the Super Bowl last night? Okay. To me, the Rihanna video in the middle where she's got all these bullish platforms and they had drones flying and crazy, you know, uh, fireworks, that's still kind of like the way that these guys were thinking about performance and fragmentation, like very small slivers of movement, because this became stuff like, again, if you think about the way that capturing that motion and breaking the photograph into very small slivers, that's an incredible skill set right there, because that's what cameras do. So every camera you have is still, you know, using a similar technique to what I was just showing you. But let's see. And the reason I'm showing you that is because I want to start showing you a little bit more about my work and how that goes. Yeah, I hit done again. Just show me what I'm doing wrong. I'm so curious because you hit done. Right. Okay. So done, then add. Okay. Right. So what you just saw, um, this kind of motion capture photography, artists like Marcel Duchamp tried to start copying it. And this became one of the most influential paintings at the beginning of the 20th century. It's called Nude Descending the Stairs. And uh, Marcel Duchamp revolutionized the art world at the time because he was dealing with what you call found objects. Now, amusingly enough, this kind of classic imagery here versus the photography, these are two, two mediums, painting and photography, that now have come home to roost in the form of everything from Photoshop Illustrator on over to how we think about editing video on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so imagine here you are at the beginning of the 20th century, and no one's ever seen images like this before. What's the equivalent of that with sound, right? You're breaking sound into small samples, and that's what I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> this is a studio where I'm working out of uh, for my project, Miguel. Um, it's a robotics lab called Art Matter. And what I'm doing uh, for the current batch of projects that I'm going to be presenting at Yale is taking a group of, of quantum physics equations and then dimensionalizing them running them to this robot. The robot thing can draw with what, uh, very high resolution of any anything I send it, basically. Um, and what we're doing here is kind of visualizing data, but then making small stills of it as large paintings. So this project is going to be mostly at Yale. Who knows, maybe we'll bring it here to town one time. But um, because of, you guys are into data visualization, I'm going to just zoom in here really quick. Over here, you can see we have Chuck Close versus the Mona Lisa um, <laughs> as pixels. And just kind of playing, the robot can really, basically I could just send it files from wherever I am. And um, as long as I get in touch with my team, uh, the, the production group is called Art Matter. Just uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about them in a bit. But the idea is that we're drawing a tension between the production of physical art objects and their digital representation and things like NFTs, blockchain, and so on. So you might get a physical painting that's a math equation, but A, no one owns the math equation. Um, and then B, the painting itself is more of a portrait of a process. So it's just capturing one moment. Um, and when you think about robotics and what's happening in our current moment, obviously most people are fascinated with bots, for example, like chat bots like chat GPT or Dolly, which is an art uh, project that you can just do text prompts to make art. Um, from my perspective, again, this is one project using robots to generate the paintings I'm working on. It's really fascinating. So this is one of the first ones. Um, regretfully, you can't see it, but the texture is incredibly, it's like a paintbrush is done. Um, so I've been working on these kinds of issues. Now that's for my visual art. And I do, do want to show you, again, this is going to go to various museums and galleries. Uh, much of my work usually goes between either a concert venue or an art venue, a gallery, museum, and so on. Okay, so you may ask, what is this? This is the first record cover sleeve. And most people don't realize that records used to be in a blank plate gray sleeve. In the, <laughs> the beginning of the 20th century, the vinyl that we now call record uh, is, is Shellac. And Thomas Edison, the inventor of the phonograph, 
basically was trying to figure out how to market sound. Um, and one day, I'm going to show you this. This is the inventor of the record cover sleeve, Alex Steinweiss. So he did these graphics <coughs> that would be basically, he went into Columbia Records one day and said, why don't we put an image on the album cover to give people an idea of what the song sounds like? So the graphic design informing the music and then vice versa, that's probably what we were just seeing last night at the Super Bowl. I mean, people dimensionalizing an entire song. But what's wild about this is, um, oh yeah, you guys can't see my desktop. Okay. Okay. Um, is that Steve Jobs, when he was working on the app store for the beginning of the iPhone, which came out in 2007, he said, I want people to feel like the app covers they see will actually be similar to a record cover scene. So this idea of accessing um, the graphic user interface, uh, whether it's an app that you're clicking on in your cell phone or using the buttons and other kind of what we call skeuomorphic graphics, um, those are all things that are now part of your digital kind of relationship to your devices. So one could argue Steve Jobs took that idea from IBM and the idea of the graphic user interface is what makes this connect. So hopefully I'm not losing you guys. I'm showing you a little bit of history of graphics, a little bit of history of long art art, uh, how we think about that with dimensionality. And then some of the earlier math issues I was talking about with the idea of zero, tuning systems, math, and art. So all of this is interdisciplinary. Okay, so whenever I do an album, I usually do my own graphics. Uh, sense of humor here, a lot of my work is kind of right now in political context around climate change and the arts. Um, so I've been kind of doing these fun posters and graphics for a while. Um, I'm going to unpack a little bit this later, but I did want to show you, this is more of music graphics, and then I have my fine art stuff that I do for Yale and other kind of things like that. All right. So I just want to show you a couple more things to get you into the more current stuff. All right. So when you guys think about it, uh, the way that we kind of evolved, like all of the arts, is that they're tools for reimagining what's possible. Um, and that to me is super important. Okay. Okay. So this is a map drawn by Leonardo da Vinci in uh, 14, uh, if I remember correctly, it's 1492, I think, or 72. But it's called an axonometric representation. And because you guys are into data visualization, I'll give you a little bit of backdrop. This is a map drawn by hand by Da Vinci. And basically, the, the Duke of uh, the Medici, um, Cosimo and Medici, needed a, a map because they were about to have a war with this small city state called Imola. So he said, Hey, man, can you draw a map for the troops? And we need to be able to have military, high quality map. And so he came, uh, Da Vinci came back with this, and the Duke was like, hey, how am I going to read this? What, you know, what is this? He says, it's a map of the city from above. And obviously at that time, Da Vinci didn't have satellites. Uh, but he was able to draw a hyper-accurate map of the city from above, and that's what you call axonometric representation. Now, this is the same city using Google Maps 500 years later. And it's incredible that an artist was able to draw this by hand think about the dimensionality and then represent the city. And then several hundred years later, we have satellites in the sky and you realize he was right. So, you know, so this is where data visualization and the idea of the legible landscape come into play here. Um, if you're Da Vinci being able to imagine a city from above, draw the routes, the roads, everything again by hand before the invention of satellites, before the invention of the cameras that would even be able to put in that particular orbit to look down, you know, it's pretty incredible that this is now Google Maps. So for my last book with MIT, I've done uh, four books with MIT. Uh, five, well, five books total and two with MIT, sorry. Um, I was fascinated with this idea that the artist can help us reimagine what's possible. And if you're seeing a map of Imola uh, like this, and you realize how did Da Vinci visualize this several hundred years before the invention of satellites would enable people to even think about that kind of seeing the world from above. Now, there's another term that's just called the overview effect. And Google Maps, uh, the inventor of that, uh, Noel Gordon, uh, is my last book. I interviewed him about how Google Maps algorithms intersect with the landscape. 
Uh, all this is on my website and my books are on MIT, which is Amazon and whatever, if you're so inclined. Okay, so here's another dimension. This is ARPANET in 1969. And at the rise of modern computing, many of us thought that, let's say, for example, like Alan Turing, uh, the idea of the Turing test or World War II, uh, he was able to crack the German encryption codes for what they call the Enigma device. And at that time, the Germans were quite far ahead in mathematics. So, for example, the invention of the jet engine, uh, even our NASA comes out of a group of German scientists, uh, Brenner von Braun, uh, who start, helped start NASA. But amusing enough, the US military was trying to figure out later how could you communicate if there was a nuclear war? So they, they posed this to a group of mathematicians. So we'd need a distributed network where we'd always be able to send a message wherever we were throughout the network. And so eventually that was called ARPANET. And it began with four hubs. This is the beginning of the internet. Now, amusingly enough, uh, the internet turned 50 in 2019. So from 1969 to 2019, that's 50 years, I was commissioned to do a symphony about that. And so the first symphony uh, written the, relating to the, the, the complexity of the nodes of the internet. I like the idea that the internet, as we know, it started from between UCLA and Stanford Research Institute. So first two hops of the internet there. How would you change that into math and music? Would you do an L sort of a logarithmic or an algorithmic, you know, or exponential growth? Because now there's billions of nodes instead of four. Or if you were to take that equation and put that through a different kind of math to generate tones, which is computers. So when I was working on the project, um, I went back and forth and was batting the idea around about, you know, kind of composing with data, but then having that be part of like the patterns that would make the symphony or the, so I ended up having a choir of young women sing, um, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But Part of the concert was hosted with this gentleman. Uh, he's a very renowned math both mathematician and computer coder. His name is Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and he invented the web uh, in 1989. Uh, so the web is different than the internet, but the equations he was dealing with to create this idea of sending messages quickly, he was based in Switzerland at um, a particle accelerator lab called CERN in Switzerland. Um, and they realized that the sheer volume of data they needed to index uh, was massive. So he said, you know, let's make this a hypertext markup language, HTML. And he called it the semantic web. So assigning both math and language to be able to generate the web. Now, fast forward to 2023, here we are. Um, so it's like when I showed you that uh, the controversial Italian futurists versus later on loudspeakers, you can see these equations have become data visualizations, but they're now just on all of your cell phones and devices as browsers. You know, so amusing enough that the web browser, uh, the idea of this indexable search, um, those were all developed at universities and they were privatized. So Google, for example, was, should be paying him, uh, sending him a big paycheck every day. Uh, but he said, hey, I'm into the public arts, I'm into open source culture. Um, so he, they made it free. And so that changed the evolution of the internet. So I consider myself an artist who looks at uh, these kind of historical connections and the way that they can kind of inform our current practice. Um, so the idea of semantic web of assigning language to kind of think about, you know, data generation, those are things that he's very renowned for. But in our era of chat GPT, um, how does that become creative? Um, right now, a lot of, there's a lot of controversy. Here you are at university, I have various friends who are professors and they said all their students are using chat GPT to make their essays now. Um, and so too with art and so too with music because there's now a text, it's called text prompt based uh, generative material. And so it still goes back to some of the issues that Sir Tim Berners-Lee was grappling with. Um, so the invention of the web made humanity have an informal relationship to the logic of exponential growth. Um, and when I say the logic of exponential, think about it. 2007, the first iPhone comes out, fast forward to 2023, um, and you can easily see how much data has become part of the basic vocabulary of you know, our society. So one could argue, we live in a data-driven society. How does the arts reflect that? And that's kind of what my, my discussion today is about. Okay, another first was 
the first uh, satellite to go around the Earth uh, was called uh, Sputnik, and it was the Russians in the late 50s or early 60s that set this up. And the satellite went around the Earth, and amusing enough, was using what you call tel telemetry signals. And those signals were just a small bleep, bleep, bleep. And so they, the, the Americans heard that, and people were turning on their radios, and no one knew why this weird electronic sound was playing on everyone's radio. And it was scandalous and shocking. Um, people, you know, thought the Russians were going to invade, or there was going to be some crazy. Same thing right now with this balloon that just flew over the U.S. Um, so, using enough, when people aren't sure of the technologies or what's happening, they get just a little bit nervous. Um, so people thought it was a UFO. Uh, there was all sorts of like fighter jets were scrambled. But um, amusing enough, the reason I'm showing you Sputnik is it was the first sound heard around the world. So everyone heard this bleep wherever you were. If you were in Brazil, if you're at the North Pole, if you were in you know South Africa, you name it, you would turn on your radio and you'd hear this faint electronic bleep. So I'd like to say that's the first global concert, you know, techno concert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and if everyone's hearing the synchronized, very specific telemetry signal, what they were doing, the Russians were able to track where it was by sending a sound and pinging it in orbit. And that's how they were able to tell the location of the satellite. So these are all things that are pretty intriguing because you're, you, there are different ways of data visualizing. So imagine if your radio is getting a certain sound of a certain thing at a certain tempo, it's creating a mathematical portrait or a topology. And I love the fact that that's kind of a topology that, you know, determined the Cold War, uh, the middle of the 20th century, and now we just call it GPS, you know. <laughs> um, so these are all things that were the arts versus the you know, Cold War versus other kinds of things. Hopefully you guys are getting that these are metaphors that I'm using to inform some of my own art practice. All right. So. There's plenty of stuff I could show you. What I wanted to do is as much as possible. Uh, give you a sense that it's about interdisciplinary approach. So when I was showing you the robots that I work with, uh, amusingly enough, um, there's a lot of to be said for how we look at the creative process and sound. So hold on one second. There we go. So this is the Acropolis. Um, one of my pro projects, we got the Greek government to give me the Acropolis for a concert. And also, so you can see those are really big sound systems. What I did was put uh, loudspeakers throughout the ruins of the Acropolis. And that's just, you know, yours truly there, a little bit of hip hop moment, so that's some fun. But we put these huge speakers throughout the ruins. And um, we played a film I've been working on called Rebirth of a Nation. And uh, basically, I got the rights to D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, uh, which is a very controversial, very racist and twisted film. And then I broke the film up into different layers and called that project sort of director as DJ. And we projected uh, the film throughout the ruins of the Acropolis and had a concert. So I had about 5,000 people come to the show. Just give me a little bit of context here. It's a big, it's, a, it's the Herod Atticus Theater at the base of the Acropolis. And so I said, hey, you know, there was a sold out show. I'm like, hey, everybody, thanks for coming to the show. I'm the first DJ to play here in like 2,000 years. <laughs> um, but so this is the collision between data you know, data-driven music, electronic music, and this kind of histor historical architecture and design. So those are things that inform my practice, but I want you guys as much as possible to realize, I could have done this whole lecture just showing you the software I used to edit music, which I don't think would be that compelling. But I also feel like when I do these talks, you want to give people a little bit of history, a little bit of context, and the ability to think about digital culture, not just as a part of your computer, but the, the cultural landscape that that computing comes out of. So our math, for example, one, two, three, and so on, that doesn't just derive from nowhere. It arrives because someone literally took it, copied it, gave it to someone in Italy. They copied those numbers, and then next thing you know, they, they became popular because of stuff like the Gutenberg printing press or other kinds of things that would, for example, give you a composer notated music that you would read as a sheet music. That was a big deal. You usually had to write it by hand. Uh, but having stuff like the Gutenberg printing press that revolutionized the middle of the Renaissance forward and fast forward to now where you could probably be doing symphonies from your cell phone. Um, last night, for example, the Rihanna, uh, I always forget, intermission uh, for the Super Bowl. Is that what you call it in the middle of the Super Bowl? Half -time. Half -time. Half -time. 
you guys, I, don't, I'm, I play soccer. I don't really watch it. But I know that's huge, too. It's like, um, did anybody watch that? The, the mid-time, half-time? It was really complex. I mean, the, they had all these people dancing on platforms. They were rising. They were flying drones through it. Plus, on top of that, the um, fireworks were all just super mathematical. The whole thing looked really... Uh, me and Courtney we watched it. I was like, my God, that was, that was for that 15. How long was it? 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Yeah. Every single second it would be hyper choreographed. And somebody was probably sitting in a booth controlling all the lights, and making sure that they were synchronized with some software and things like that. So, as an artist, you're like, okay, how would I do that? <laughs> Um, and, you know, these are all things that right now, anyone who's growing up in a digital context, you're going to be thinking about the performing arts and its evolution because of digital culture right now. It's going into warp speed. So when I got this project together and I was playing Birth of a Nation, I'm using you know, some of, it's a controversial film, you know, undoubtedly because it's a KKK propaganda film. Mm -hmm. And I usually I have to say to the audience, hey, I can assure you I'm not a clan member, just, you know, <laughs> just so we're on the same page there. But there's also a digital media approach to this because it's it's about the fragmentation of the narrative, of cinematic experience and immersive media. So hopefully I'm not uh, losing you guys in the sense that I want as much as possible to give a little bit of context to the work. Now, this all goes um, a little bit further over Two projects that I'm going to be working on over the next year um, at Yale. So part of that is this. I'm just going to show you really quick. All right. So this is Earth Day. Um, it's a, we had about a million plus people. This is just a couple of years ago for Earth Day. I'm, that's me DJing with about a million people there. Then me, uh, the band of Flamey Lips, uh, the Roots, which is very popular to talk to. But I had just gotten back from Antarctica. And I went to Antarctica to do photography and climate data approached art. Uh, and you may ask, what is that? Well, I took the temperature differentials of the days we were there and compared them to the overall trajectory of global warming. Um, and photography I was doing and these kind of large scale portraits of ice uh, went into a book and the book is called The Book of Ice. Um, and I'll show you that just as well. And that's one of the last book projects. Um, I'm currently working on a bunch of books, the most of which are in development because of just the basic you know, pandemic and so on. Um, one second, I just want to show you guys. So, uh, Book of Ice, one second. So I wrote this book um, in Antarctica basically carrying a backpack uh, with uh, various computer gear uh, and photography. And this became a multimedia symphony that's gone to a bunch of art houses and museums as well. Um, and a concert of it looked something like this, where this was at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And we worked with a group of architects called Terraform to dimensionalize uh, different kind of crystal ice structures. And then we would project different kinds of data about the, the ice and the crystal structures. And I would have an ensemble playing with me. Um, so I write classical music, I do hip hop, techno, dubstep. But when you do concerts, I try as much as possible not to think about set design. And the architects I work with, uh, Terraform, they, they, they've gone on to become very renowned uh, for thinking about biotech and architecture. Um, so that's one concert, again, sold out. We had about a thousand people at the show. And I also made an album that was based on open source climate data. Um, called of water and ice and I do the artwork for all my albums and books but the idea here is that the ice in Antarctica and uh, the North Pole is melting there's no question about it climate data is very clear science is clear 
<laughs> so as a composer, how do you think about visualizing that and that crisis and thinking about it in terms of pattern recognition? So that's what I ended up doing, and I use that to generate electronic music, which I can, there's there's all sorts of examples. If you go to YouTube, which is generally easiest, you can just type in DJ Spooky of Water and Ice. We had millions of people, uh, views, debt remixes, kids were going crazy with this stuff. And the idea was to take uh, the climate data and make it open source, because it is open source, but make it with electronic music as patterns. And then we put the project on YouTube, and we had millions of uh, views, downloads, and so on. Uh, so the idea was envisioning information about climate change um, as an open source album. Um, and so that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's plenty of other projects. I work on projects constantly. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, Courtney, in terms of examples, I can either show more or do, should we open up to questions? What do you think? Because it's, uh, we got 15 minutes. Questions are, yeah. Okay. I wonder. Yeah, maybe, maybe then there's an opportunity to show more. Yeah. So, anybody have any questions, comments? You guys are shy. Okay. By the way, the town you mentioned, Imola, is very close to my town in Italy, to Bologna. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I was curious about Birth of a Nation because, as you said, it's a pretty horrible movie. I mean, W.D. Griffith is credited as an innovator of cinema, creating a lot of the grammar. At the same time, he did Birth of a Nation, which was horrible and was based on The Klansman, which was a play at the time. So I was curious to see how you kind of broke it up and how was it received by the audience? Yeah, yeah, we had a really good um, response. It's to the project I had Kronos Quartet, which is legendary yeah. string quartet. Uh, they played my compositions for that. Uh, we toured it to mostly art house places. Uh, and in the art world, controversy is okay. I mean, the idea was to spark the controversy and to also be able to uh, talk about the representation and ethnicity in this time, you know, where cinema has pivoted to digital culture, everything from TikTok to Instagram and so on. Uh, and then the crisis now, everyone is talking about critical race theory, and even they're also wanting to ban books and do all sorts of stuff. So, you know, it's still the controversy. You know, it's also the first film to show um, a flawed election as well. You know, like with, so there's, it's it's a very interesting film from the viewpoint of. Um, hang tight, let me just show you really quick. So on my website, I have quite a bit of the stuff that uh, basically do open source initiatives. And so Birth of a Nation was from 1915. So we worked with Library of Congress and later on, I did a box set on the history of African-American cinema. Um, and that one was just called Pioneers of African-American mm -hmm. Cinema. So uh, let me show you that really quickly. Just a very famous. <laughs> yeah, I, it won a lot of awards. And by the way, everything I'm talking about is on my website. Um, the book of ice is open source. So as much as possible, I firmly believe that climate data should be uh, a part of the public domain. Um, and so what I'm doing for my music projects, especially with the more political and digital immersive ones, are to make the, da the data uh, available for all. So anyone can remix and transform. And um, I'm a big fan of Harvard's uh, Berkman Law Center. And uh, Harvard has this initiative called the Creative Commons. Um, so I, I run a lot of my projects to that as well. So hopefully that's giving you guys a little bit of context. Hey. Have you done anything with motion capture? We have probably the most advanced motion capture studio in the country on this campus. I've done music for. Um, James Cameron used some of my music and uh, interviewed me for a series on the history of science fiction. And I know that that was, there was motion capture because he's, he's always doing crazy animation. But on my stuff, I um, um, just want to show you this really quickly. Um, well, you showed the early things that led to motion capture, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, the, the beginning of motion capture is really fascinating because it relates to both photography and the human mind itself because we we're always seeing a fragment of something like if you say for example you're holding your hand up the signal that's going to your brain is arriving several microseconds after you've done the gesture so same with when you see anything you realize the human eye is seeing uh 
a kind of a ocean of small fragments, but we're giving it the brain is what is giving it actual co cohesion and continuity. So I wanted to show you something actually um, because I remember you're into um, neuroscience. So I've been working with brain sensors mm -hmm. that read uh, your brain uh, it emits five major waveforms: delta, uh, delta, theta, beta, and gamma. And one other one should be like. Really. <laughs> But the sensor um, takes that the, the brain wave patterns and creates a feedback mechanism so I can start thinking about patterns and then slowly the visuals that are being generated uh, and the electronic music that is also being generated become sort of uh, pattern variants what I'm thinking about. So it's kind of this is going to be for the next album. I mean, it's in development now, so I'm going to pre present it for now when, I, when I'm done at Yale. So I usually work about a year out. But yeah, this is neuroscience kind of oriented. So we're, we're doing uh, something very much related to that. Right now, that image the brain, you need to get on a tube called an fMRI and get those images. And we've used uh, what we know about uh, engineering system identification to take that headset and create a very detailed pattern of the brain, just like you'd get from an fMRI, but you're sitting in a chair. Yeah, and the idea is where what I'm doing is watching the those those images behind me are light patterns that are being generated by my thought patterns. Um, we're experimenting right now, and that was the idea was it was going to do a whole album based on this, uh, where all the electronic music is based on feedback. I mean, they're making apps now where you can meditate with the sound, for example, and then you you kind of synchronize your breathing and your uh, patterns. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that there are five or six frequencies. Well, after two years of doing this, there are more than five or six. And they're likened to the keys on a piano. Each um, pattern is associated with a frequency. And the brain combines those into chords and then those chords into what we call a symphony. So at any one time, our model looks like a symphony of music. That the brain's plan. I would love to see more of your research on that because um, I'm in. The, we're doing a series of experiments, and I'm happy to learn more. I got a, a two-page thing for you. <laughs> well, I didn't write it for him. I wrote it, I wrote it for my wife, really, because she kept asking me, "What do you do?" <laughs> and I had to come up with an analogy, but it's ironic that you're talking like this. Well, I I, I firmly believe everything is pattern recognition. So a song is just a pattern, you know? And so if you look at a painting or if you photograph or anything, everything is the way the human mind puts it together. So why a lot of like, there's a whole new philosophy that a lot of uh, like tech billionaires are getting into uh, like Peter Thiel or the guy who owns Oracle, it's like Larry Ellis, you know, uh, not Jeff Bezos so much, but it's called accelerationism. And Peter Thiel, oh, he started Palantir, which is kind of a data surveillance, and they, they work with like the CIA and stuff like that. Um, there's a whole, these guys are saying that capitalism and philosophy, uh, you know, moving into a future technopia, you know, like I, people are tech, techno utopian. I'm not, because I feel like a lot of the billionaire demographic that's really into that. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Peter Thiel, Larry Ellis, uh, they feel that technology will solve everything and that we're going to be able to, you know, have a spaceship. Like Elon Musk is also part of this. Um, I think of it as just tools for helping us envision a better approach to things. Like that's what I was showing you at the beginning, the map uh, that the, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci did for the Medici, but they wouldn't even be able to have the tool to dimensionalize that for 400 years later. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and you wonder how would an artist be able to envision that city, a city from above, you know, because if you never thought about it, the technology exists to open the conversation up. I got to teach a class, but I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you. If you leave the paper, is there a contact or email on it? Yeah, this is my sister right here. So <laughs> she can do it. Tomorrow a little bit, yeah. so maybe we'll bring Jim over and you guys can have an espresso. Yeah, or, we're gonna or have, free. A, yeah. we're gonna have a double espresso. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic.
And thank you, Jim, for your question. Um, I know it's it's two fifty five, and I think you know just to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, just any last question? I have a quick question. So, um, Courtney and I have the Vivid Lab, which is done for visceral intrasensory visualization information design. You talked a little bit about sound, and then you talked a little bit about brain waves. What other senses or modalities? Do you try to engage? Do you ever try to combine the senses? So you have sound, but maybe you have some something on your some sensor that also vibrates with the sound. And I'm just curious, are you exploring that space at all? Absolutely. Um, I at the moment uh, with Yale, I have about a year of lead time development, but there's a there's a guy who I'm bouncing, we're we're kind of doing rough drafts. In fact, when I fly back, I have a meeting with him on Friday. His name is David Edwards. He is the um <laughs> it's easier to show you really quick. Um, he's working on food that you can breathe. Food that you can um, Yeah, uh, yeah. He, basically, he's the head of bioengineering at Harvard. And here, I'll just show you really quick. I have been known to inhale chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's doing is, uh, let me show you really quick. <laughs> uh, second. All right. So David um, is doing this whole sort of bioengineering stuff at Harvard. Uh, me and him are going to do a pop up restaurant where you can breathe the food. But That's we're, awesome. We're working on it this summer. Uh, but he, he's doing a bioengineering kind of approach to what you could food, like, like the term, if I remember correctly, it's called molecular gastronomy you know where you're like your gut biome responds to like blueberries or other like ginger or other stuff that actually is quite healthy for you and, or or chilies or something like habanero and chilies oh. but he wants you to be able to breathe it and there's a different kind of caloric response wow. um he, he's done like major ted talks he has a best-selling book on the new york times bestseller so um me and him are going to do a pop-up restaurant called science where the food is all going to be kind of scientific i'm really interested in um, seaweed and algae for example um, so yeah these are all multiple different projects and food is something i've been wanting to do music for for a while like um like, like a science meal where each course of the meal has different music that goes with the you know just like that he's, he's a very interesting guy okay so <laughs> That's really cool. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And, and by the way, if you were, guys were too shy to ask any particular question, I'm going to be around for the next couple of days. And I'm a relaxed, easy going person. So feel free to drop a line or my website is djspooky.com. Uh, I check messages constantly. So if you if there's something that was of interest, uh, you know, so I hope that I've given you just a little bit of an overview of both my work process, the research process. And above all, this kind of interdisciplinary approach. Um, all my books are on my website, and I usually publish with MIT about art and technology. So, and if anyone happens to be at Yale, you know.